I had the opportunity of introducing the speaker today, and I was going to read his bio, but he introduced himself uh, when he stood up, so I kind of blew that thing for a moment. So let me just uh, say that it's a, it's a privilege to introduce uh, Stephen McDonald. Stephen and I have gotten to know each other um, for just about a year this month, actually. I was in the process of writing the book, and uh, I was getting my car washed at a Kirkland car wash, believe it or not. And uh, I was sitting down, and you know, it's one of those processes that takes about 20 or 30 minutes for your car to go through. So I decided to pop open my Microsoft Surface and start working on my book a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) The Redmond Company. Uh, (laughs) So, uh, duly (laughs) sculpted. So, uh, so anyway, I popped my Surface. Well, Stephen comes through there and sits down, and he strikes a conversation. He had just bought a Surface and hadn't even popped it out of the box yet. We got into a conversation on the surface for about two seconds, and then our hearts connected um, in the journey of walking with Christ together, and we started talking about the book. And I tell that story because it emulates who Stephen really is. He's a man of God, he's a man of faith, but he's a business guy that loves the city of Bellevue, loves the business people in Bellevue, and has been an inspiration in my life. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, mm-hmm. Stephen McDonald. I'm in the <laughs> Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Uh, it's just a real honor to be here. I was out last night and uh, I came back home and took Eric's book out. So basically I've been asked to share on chapter 7, 8, and 9 of this book. So we'll cover that there. But la- last night it was kind of funny how uh, Providence God or whatever it is, you know, uh, what's in your path, how things work out. But um, actually, before I start, I just want to say thank you to Eric. Actually, Eric's been an inspiration to me as well. Sometimes you get into situations where you're with people who will humor you. But Eric says, just get it done. So I can't, see, I can't complain twice to Eric, so I've got to get it done. So his vision blocking mechanisms are pretty high. So uh, he's been an inspiration. I want to say thank you to John and to the group, these people who are organizing community groups. It's, it's surprising that I, myself, I do a group also uh, in the room right next door. Once a month, we have maybe 30, 40, 50 people. And it's exactly the same as what we have here. And I'm just so blessed and so encouraged to have people like you who are Christ followers. It's not religion. There's a living God who loves and cares for us, who wants to penetrate in our lives and wants to influence your family, wants to influence your health, your life. So I'm just really, really inspired. I met John and... Uh, I'm speaking here today, so it's funny you shake hands with some people and all of a sudden you realize you're doing things you hadn't planned to do. <laughs> so he's that kind of guy. Um, we're talking on vision, and uh, we'll talk about vision blockers, you know, the concept of vision blocking. But I, I was out last night, <clears throat> and, and I noticed I'm looking around the room here, and I see people that are all maybe over 25. Would that be a safe <laughs> assumption to say that? I think, I think I'm quite safe with that there. Maybe 26 will push it a little bit, you know. But I was with <clears throat> a bunch of uh, athletes and young people last night. Uh, there was a soccer player called Steve Zakowani. I don't know if you know who that is. A, a sound, he's played for the Sounders for five years. He just retired last, uh, last Monday, and he's really doing a, a teaching on leadership. So uh, I, he was going to come and speak at my lunch next month, so I thought I need to go along and listen to this guy and kind of sit in the back. So I'm the old guy, you know, with the glasses so I can see, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, I just want to say that I was so inspired by young men and women at 25 years old, their faith, their vision, it totally blew me away. I came home late last night. We talked late into the night with these young people. They have vision like I've never seen it before. And I was really inspired. And so I had different notes and comments here, which I thought was pretty intelligent to try and cater to your intellect, you know. But I'm going to be really simple and just try and uh, express what I caught last night from these young men and women who are making a difference in their communities, okay? So that's kind of where I'm coming from. I just got back from Scotland last, uh, I'm from Scotland just by the way, just if you don't notice that, so (laughs) if you need subtitles, we'll put something on the board, California, (laughs) East California, (laughs) East East Coast, yeah, East Coast. Um, But what happens is I came from from Scotland about 20 years ago, and I go back maybe every year, every two years I go back. So it's my brother's 50th birthday party. I went back last, the last Wednesday for his 50th party. And the nice thing is when you go into a culture and you leave, come over to this culture, and you go back in again right, every two years, you get snapshots, right? How are you doing? How are you doing? You know, you kind of see people. And, and that's kind of what I've had over 20 years. And the, the interesting thing is that the people with vision, right, young and old, whether they're 20, 30, 50, 80, the people with vision I see are living large. Mm-hmm. 
right? The people who have no vision uh, are not doing good. Some of them are doing really bad. And I feel as if I'm not a pastor, right? But I feel when I go back sometimes, I love these people so much that I feel like a pastor. And a lot of it is really just changing people's perspectives. Are you giving them a fresh vision? You know, this is maybe look at it this way. And once you see it that way, which is your vision, you're attracted towards it. That makes sense. I have a brother uh, who had no vision and uh, uh, extremely talented guy. Probably one of the best salespeople you ever meet. Like by the age of 21, he was a top salesman in Europe for Audi Volkswagen. So that, and so he's like, that kind of guy is. He would always say, never sell Steve until they say no. Right? Anyway, he had, he had no vision for his health. And last Wednesday, he lost uh, his sight of his, left, his right eye through like, diabetes, bad, bad health, right? Now, he's on a fast track. It could have been helped, but he had no vision. He always wanted to change his diet. Extremely talented. Everyone's a piece of him, but he never prioritized that part of it. So vision to me is not like a let's be inspired. I think it's an oxygen that we can have in life that can change who you are. I have two older gentlemen who can mentor me. And uh, one is 88 and one is, uh, I want to say 62, but I know some people might think that's not that old. But to me, as 47-year-old guys, a little older than me, okay? So just perspective, right? Perspective, right? But the idea is that these two people, the 62 and 82, one of the things that really inspire me and attract me as a younger person is that they have vision. My friend, who is 62 years old, he's probably one of the most successful people in the sports world, uh, he has had challenges with his wife. And he has a vision for a healthy family, right? And at 62 years old, even last week, he's away on a camp with his wife, a retreat to make his wife, his, his life, his relationship with his wife better. Does that make sense? So vision, vision attracts things, attracts people, attracts me to all the people. And last night I really felt, you know, you that realization that I'm the old guy. Ever had that moment? <laughs> Maybe I hit that yet. But I was sitting there with these younger people and I thought, I want to be, these people have been that to me. And I want to be that to these younger guys. And I, I just hung out for probably an hour and just talked to them. And they're like, what about this, what about that? And I'm like, I don't really know, but here's a couple of perspectives that I can help you. This is what I did wrong. <laughs> this is what I did right. This is what worked for me. And I say, but this is my vision. And when we started talking that way, it attracts people. It pulls out from people the now into the future. And people can relate to that. Does that make sense? So vision to me is absolutely crucial. And if you don't have it, I would encourage you today. I think I'm a very simple talk. But I want you to, we talk about the idea with our guys as like head, heart, and feet, right? We have a lot of head stuff, right? I see in some different culture, cultures and countries I'm in that we don't have the knowledge. We have so much knowledge here. We are so blessed. We are so fortunate. But a lot of times it's maybe in our heads. Does that make sense? So we want to get it from our heads into our hearts, you know, and into our feet. I, let's walk out some of these really simple principles that will change your life change your family's life, your culture, and maybe your, your grandkids, you know. Uh, my father-in-law is 88 years old, and uh, he is, uh, he's all about family because his father left him when he was like 10 or 12. So his whole vision was to have a family. He has nine kids, which is my wife, is part of that nine kids. They have now have grandkids. When we get together, right, it's, it's like this room here. This is like a breakfast, right? They, there's kids everywhere. It's a riot. But his vision... 50 years ago was to have a healthy family, right? And he lives it right now at 88, and he's inspired by that. And he pours and he prays for these kids, and he's around and engaged. So I don't think it's age-related. I guess that's what I'm getting at. If you're 20 years old, you need a vision real bad. If you're 80 years old, you still need a vision because people need what you have inside you and what you've gone through. And it's funny, I was with some people last week, and they, and they said to me, he was an elderly gentleman, said, you know, it's funny when I'm older, people don't listen to me that much. Right? And I was laughing because, you know, I'm sitting there just sucking everything I can out of this guy's wisdom and perspectives, you know. And the concept, I just want to say this here is, you know, when you're 20 years old, you take off, like you're in an airplane. And you take off in your airplane. You look out the window, you can see the runway, right? And then you take off the end of the runway. You can see the village, right? That kind of idea. Then you're up in the sky, you can see the city. You ever feel that kind of Well, if you're 80, 90, 100, right? You're up here and your perspectives, I need your perspectives. Does that make sense? And if you're 20, you know, I need to share my perspective, my vision. Okay? So vision is powerful. Vision changes lives. 
One other thing I just want to say about vision is this. I, uh, I used to play uh, rugby. You know what rugby is? It's like a sport rugby. So I used to play for a club. And uh, so you get to a certain level of, so we used to travel a lot. And, you know, people think rugby is a big hairy man walking around and, you know, like <laughs> slavering over each other and, you know, crushing each other. There's probably an element of that. But the idea is that when you get to a club level, it's really quite an intelligent game. Right? The whole thing is really, it's really in your head. Yeah, yeah. It's cold, it's wet, it's hard. But we're all physically fit. We're all fast. We're all, we all know technically what to do, right? But the game was that I would do, if I was with Cliff, and he's my opposite guy, right? My whole game at that level is to get into your head. Mm -hmm. I look, Cliff, you know what? Yeah. How are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm there rubbing him and messing him, you know. And take we, my ball. Take my ball. <laughs> but the idea is to play with his head, right? If I can get his head off for 10 seconds, I can score. Does that make sense? Vision is like that. If you think there's a good God and there's somebody not good up there, right? The God, bad guy wants to knock you off your game. And the good guy, which is God, right, wants you to have a vision, right? And the game is, I think, that you have to have a clear vision so you know when you're getting knocked off. Does that make sense? So the clearer the vision is, the, the better focus is, and at least for me, as I'm getting older, you get less and less distracted by things that are non-vision related. Does that make sense? Time is valuable. The other thing with vision I wanted to mention was that I, I, I was part of a group of, of business people. We got together and we had maybe 800 to 1,000 people. We took them through a school for 16 weeks. And we talked about how to develop business. And one of the big things was with the clearer vision, right, the clearer vision, we start to realize that I can't get to where I want to go. Does that make sense? Then what happens, the clearer the vision is, the bigger the obstacle. But what kicks in is creativity. Right? Creativity. Our God is creative. We have a creative God. Does that make sense? So what I found is the clearer the vision is, we then see the obstacles. Then we have, our, our brain is so powerful, our subconscious is that it pops up. We have business people now all over Bellevue who are using the principles of creativity via vision. Because the minute you have a clear picture of vision, the minute you see I can't do it, the minute your subconscious goes, okay, we have a problem. But it only comes from a crystallized, clear vision. Does that make sense? So the concept that we've found over the last few years in the business community, faith-based, is we, we go to God, we, we quiet down, this is where we're going, this is what we feel is right, how do we get there? And ideas come from God. Creativity comes from God. Answers come from God. And it is powerful. So I just say that, you know, the, distract, the big distractor, let's keep him in his box. Let's keep it really clear. And then let's ask God for creativity. And that's an exciting way to live. It's not, our resources are not just me. There's more to it than us. So anyway, is that okay just to share that as a concept? So jumping into chapter 7, uh, Dr. Uh, Eric Scrogan uh, basically covered the concept of a vision blocker. And uh, this was one thing that was kind of close to my heart. But the concept is that your past, right, past hurts and pains and things that happen to you can damage your future. Does that make sense? And I was thinking, you know, what's a good way to describe that? And as I, uh, when I was back in Scotland, there's a, there's a story about my grandfather. He's a young eligible bachelor way back when, right? And he'd go around to, to tea parties in Scotland, had these tea parties, you know, and uh, what would happen is in the tea parties is that it's kind of an eligible bachelor kind of concept where you meet people and socialize, and that's where you'd meet your bride, right? And uh, so he was a fussy guy, I guess, right? He just couldn't get it right. Everybody's like, who's the, who's the girl? Who's the girl? One day he goes to this tea party, and this lady, Mary, uh, comes up and says, Would you like some tea? He said, Yes, I like half a cup of tea. So she poured him some half a cup of tea. And then so they, he proposes, they get married. This is supposed to be a true story. That's my grandmother, Mary, right? They married. So in the marriage, right? And she says, you know, you're the eligible bachelor and Mr. Fussy Guy, you meet me and all of a sudden you propose. What happened? He said, well, actually, I, I asked you for half a cup of tea and you gave me half a cup of tea. And she said, there's only half a cup of tea left in the teapot. <laughs> <laughs> true story. <laughs> right? Isn't that crazy, that? It's a true story. It's supposed to be. <laughs> the concept is that you're in a marriage now that you didn't even realize you were, for the, different, the, the whole basis of your relationship is gone, right? And sometimes in life when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, what I've noticed is that um, I took 30, 40 men away for a retreat. 
went over to the peninsula, and we got into vision casting, right? We get, and let's, let's make a difference. Let's do something in our lives, in our families, in our health. Let's go after it. And the biggest thing was that things that happened at 12, 13, 9, 10 years old in the relationships or with their dads at that early age was affecting people at 60 years old, 50, 30, 40, 20, at that formative year of your life. So I'm like, well, how, how does that work? <clears throat> well, I was thinking, I'm, I'm fine. I'm okay. Well, about um, five years ago, my oldest son, who's nine, I've got a 19, 18, and a 13-year-old. My oldest son was, I think, 13 at the time. And when I was 13, I was part of a group of people. It was kind of like a church. And over in Scotland, it was a lot of religion. And it's really not good. It's actually, to me, it's kind of evil, actually. So at 13 years old, my, my family's part of a group of, like a church or a, a religion. And it was just out of order. So my grandfather and my dad decided, this is not working, we're out of here. Well, that community kind of blackballed my dad. And he was rejected. He's a dentist, very successful guy. He had a surgery, devil guys, you know. Boom. They just blackballed him in his community. So as a 13-year-old kid, I suffered rejection like I would never knew. I didn't know what was going on. I, mean, I couldn't process. I think I was 13, maybe 9, 12, 13, I don't know what it was. But I had rejection inside me. And I didn't know that until five years ago. And I would never do, I would never speak at these kind of events. I would always hide. I don't want to go there. People reject me or whatever. I just, I'd, I'd below the radar. And then I, I, my son was 13 years old. And I was chatting to my brother. And he said, do you remember this happened, Steve? I said, no, I don't. And I actually physically blocked it out of my brain. But it was, a, it was something was inside me. Does that make sense? That stopped me going over here. And I couldn't even see it. Right? But when my son became that age... I related to that and I realized that something happened to me at that age and all of a sudden I got super angry. I was pissed. I don't know whether to describe it, right? I was so pissed. I went into, and I hate that word, but I, I couldn't even verbalize how upset I was. And I had a meeting with one of the top guys in Intel and I just couldn't get my head. I couldn't even focus with this guy. My wife comes out, she, she calls me. I'm like, honey, I can't talk right now. And I always want to talk to my wife. We're really close. I'm like, honey, I can't talk. I sat out like Magnolia literally for a day, and I was so angry. And eventually, <clears throat> weirdly enough, I just read a book on forgiveness. I don't know why, or a little <laughs> CD thing, right? And I thought, i got to let this thing go. Two days, I was furious. But what it was, well, there was a heart inside me, right, that stopped me doing what my vision was. And I didn't even know it was there. Does that make sense? I had to make a choice to let it go. These guys are probably gone and dead and whatever, but I was so hurt from something that happened 30 odd years ago, right? So the vision blocking concept that, that uh, Dr. Eric's talking about is your past hurts can stop where you're going to go. Once we have a clear vision, if you're not dealing with things in the past, that's going to hold you back. It's a ball and chain. It can physically knock you off. I've seen in meetings where you have, it's like, you know, when... Um, when you take a compass and you just one bubble off, right? Just one bubble off. You know, we used to always joke that guy's one bubble off. You know, ever hear about that guy? Maybe I'm that guy right now. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it could be. But the idea is if you're one bubble off, it just takes you in a trajectory that's just not healthy. And that whole concept, the rugby concept in your head, I don't even have a chance to get knocked off because I'm not even on it, right? So I just wanted to just bring that concept up that there's something can be in your roots right now that sets you up in a perspective that will not let you go where you want to go. And it's, a, it's kind of a heavy topic right now, and it could, be, it could take you weeks and months to go over. But I want to just bring it to your awareness that I've dealt with it. I feel good, right? And I notice, now that I've gone through that, I notice it in other people, right? And it, it's not like an instant fix. It, something's going to happen and get released right there, or it can take a process. But the idea of addressing it can change your life, your vision, right? Your vision. There's a five-step process I want to touch on that Eric talk, talks about. The first thing, there's basically five, five points here. The first one is to recognize it. Okay? The word to recognize a problem is to formally acknowledge a problem. Does that make sense? To formally acknowledge a problem. If I say I recognize I'm a bad player at rugby, right? I'm having a bad day. If I formally acknowledge it, what I found, I'm a salesperson, a real estate agent, we always try and rationalize what's right in our head. We want to feel justified that we're sane. Does that make sense? So we have to rationalize it. But when you formally acknowledge it, even write it down, this is how I feel, this is what's going on at here. Writing it down to me and formally saying is a, is a starting process that will actually start you off on a journey. 
I have teenage kids right now. I've got a 15 year old kid whose grades are a little low the last couple of weeks, right? We went out of town for a week with my wife to Scotland. His grades just plummeted. So he's hanging out with his buddies. He likes to fish and he plays soccer for a team, right? To get him to formally acknowledge that his grades are low is like dealing with attorneys on steroids. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, if I have a problem, I'm going to hire him to negotiate for me, right? <laughs> but I said, you know what? Let's do this. Why don't you write down what you think your grades should be and where you are? And you get back to me and we'll not go fishing and soccer until that's formalized. <laughs> right there. He comes in, Dad, you know what? I'm really sorry. And this is this. And when it's in writing, he looks at it. <laughs> you know? yeah, I feel so good. I feel so smart. You ever feel like I'm so smart? It's the first time for a long time I felt smart, but it felt really good. I got a little glimmer, you know? But the idea is I think with us as adults, right? If we write down, why do I feel that way? I want to go here, and something in here is not working. Write it down and look at it, right? Formally acknowledge it. So the first stage is to recognize it. The second thing is, is, um, is something that I've done for many, many years that's really helped me, is the concept of, in the Bible, there's a book called the book of James. And in the James, a very practical book, right? It's really a how do you do things, right? Kind of how do you walk in faith? How do you unpack things? The book of James. So there's... Chapter, uh, verse number, chapter 5, verse 16, it says, uh, Confess your sins one to another that you may be healed, right? So it's an interesting concept, right? Well, the concept is, it's just confessing is to, to verbalize, right? Your sins are, 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 are anomalies, things that are out there that's not working, right? Like a vision blocker is an anomaly. Confess that, that you may be healed. I thought that's an interesting, very, very bullish statement. That you'd be healed, like made whole, Really? So over the last 10, 12 years, I have two guys. We get together for three or four weeks on a Wednesday morning, and we just share, right? We confess, we verbalize what's going on inside us, right? And, and uh, what that's found for me is that in my head, my thinking can be out here, but when I verbalize it, I know even when I'm saying it, I'm being a jerk. You ever done that? Do you, know, no, it's like, like, you understand that? So the idea is, the first thing is acknowledging it. The second is to verbalize it. Speak to somebody, your pastor, somebody that may be older than you, or somebody who's more experienced in that area. But the idea of sharing it, there's a healing tone in that actual concept of sharing it. Okay? That's a big deal. Because if somebody's been hurt and it's really hurt you, and, and you're prideful, you know, uh, that can hold you back from your, your destiny. And to go to somebody and say, you know, I've got a problem. Right? Uh, so I, I love this group here because it's a culture where you can talk and share and build relationships. But in, in relationships, I find we can share and that, that give, creates growth. And that's a very powerful tool in itself. The third thing is to forgive. Um, forgiveness is a big topic, right? But really the ultimate thing is that if, if I was offended, is it Jeff, what's your name? Kevin. Kevin. If I was offended by Kevin, right? Well, Kevin's going on with his vision, but he's offended me and I'm locked in emotionally to this problem. And it doesn't even affect him. Right? But if I haven't forgiven him, I'm kind of tracking after this guy. Right? But the idea with forgiveness is to release that. I trust in life. Right? And I release that. When you release that, it's a phenomenal feeling. There's a, uh, in the Bible it talks again about the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of a model of how to pray if you, if you think uh, prayer is a powerful thing. But it's the concept is that uh, God forgive me as I forgive others. Right? Which is a kind of a weird statement. And what that really means, what I get from that is that when I, when I release you, I am released. Does that make sense? If I'm uptight with you, I'm uptight with myself. If I'm judgmental with you, you know, does that make sense? So the idea and that, that two-way thing, as you release that person, it's not I'm, I'm condoning or blessing or whatever. I'm just releasing that. And you will find that releasing in yourself. So the form of acknowledging, sharing it, making a conscious choice to release it. And another thing is, uh, which is a big deal, is letting it heal, right? Once you let it go, I'm like, oh, that guy really irritates me, guy really irritates me, guy really irritates me, guy really irritates me. And it's like, you're really taking your brain and you're saying, I got, I, I'm, I'm on a vision and I'm thinking over here. My creativity's down, my energy's off track, I'm just, it's not happening, right? Because I'm locking into a toxic situation here. I have to let that go. And that's your journey. And what I've found is, I, I think if you get a glass of water with sand in it, right? Think of it this way, and you shake it up. Right? And you can't, you can't see anywhere, right? Okay? And I, I'm looking and I'm, I'm thinking, this is my vision. There's nothing here because I'm over here with all this stuff going on, all this internal vision blocking stuff here, right? But the concept is I release you 
right? Then there's a process of letting the, the, the sand and the, and the dust settle. Just quiet down. No, I'm not thinking there, I'm thinking here. I'm not thinking there, I'm thinking here. You're, and you'll, you'll fail, but you'll start this journey. And as that journey happens, you start to see through the water and the sands at the bottom, and your vision starts to come back again. It's like if you have a scab in your hand, you can't say, be healed. That's it, you know. The idea is that there's just nature's process happens, and it will heal. But you have to let it go. I let it go. And then this process happens. So it's not, sometimes it can be, for me it was instantaneous. I had two days of drama, and I moved on. Right? I had a few times to stir up me again, but over the long haul, I let it go. So, recognize it, confess it, forgive it, heal it. And another idea is uh, what I think is a really big deal is uh, making a choice. Uh, one thing we talk about with the, our earth group is be a, be a victor and not a victim. Right? This is my excuse. This is my problem. This is what happened. I'm a victim. Right? But the idea is if you see yourself in your vision as a victor, and this is simple stuff, guys. We all know this. But the idea is our, our self-identity is so important in these <coughs> things. Because when things happen, like what the, Dr. Egg talked about in the book, your identity gets attacked, right? You're in a marriage now you thought was completely different than what it was, right? But your identity, <coughs> but when you get your identity back, I'm a victor. I'm going somewhere. These other things tend to migrate away from you as opposed to I'm a victim. Does that make sense? So that's the How am I doing for time? Are we okay? Five minutes? Okay. Uh, two more things here. I wanted to chat. Uh, so the idea of um, vision, and we have vision blockers, which is obviously releasing that there. Health. We all know what to do for health, right? Uh, for me, a few years ago, I had a book called The 17-Day Diet. And it was a book that changed my life maybe five, six years ago, 17-Day Diet. And the idea was I went through 17 days of kind of detox, fruits, veg, lean meats, probiotics, you know, healthy stuff, supplements, take lots of water there. And the idea for that was to rest my body. And then bring in things that I could have. So right now for me, I do five days on and two days off. Right? Five days on, two days off. So after the weekend, I can eat a lot more loosely. But a lot of times I find I don't even want to do that. But five days on, two days off. And that gets me through it. I drink water. I monitor it. I've always had a, ch a challenge with, um, with sugar. I love sugar. If I start ice cream, it's the head in the bucket and away you go, right? Oh, you see Steve's feet hanging out and I'm in there having at it, you know. I'm that guy and I know it. So I just can't have, uh, I just can't start it, right? And so what I'll do at the weekend, I'll say to my wife, you know, let's have like uh, something, something nice, you know. But I have it and I, I contain it knowing that's my weakness. And what I found was uh, the concept of mindfulness, if you know that, it's being aware of what, where you're at. Mindfulness is, I realized that I was looking for something. Or I was not feeling good, so I'm looking for food to fill that, right? So what I found is that I've got to find out what that is. Maybe I want to hang out with my friends and have some fun. I'm being too serious. So the idea is what's, what's causing you to eat bad if you're eating bad? Have a look at that. Maybe journal that. That should help you a lot there. But the concept is that if you have a vision and you want to go somewhere and you're feeling cruddy all day, that's not good, right? When I have some friends, uh, one guy right now who's part of uh, a large university and he's, he's doing really well, but his health is, is giving up on him. And he's accomplished so much. He's, a, he's just a really significant guy. And so I would encourage you guys, you know, to do that. And I'm 47, a lot of my buddies right now, you start to see them, they make the choice with the little thing going on here, or they have to make a choice, right? And I would encourage you to do that. The last thing is just, uh, is the concept of um, relationships. Um, I think one of the most fulfilling things in life it is relationships and your vision for relationships is a big deal the clearer your vision is I see my relationships line up with that I people are attracted into my life because of my vision people are attracted out of my life but when I don't have a vision and when I go back to Scotland my old buddies who I meet you know as a rugby player and drinking and fighting and stuff you know and that's entertainment for them I don't have that vision right I, and it's funny, I, I, I think it's funny for 20 minutes, I kind of laugh at it, right? But, but the reality is, um, dude, you're 47 years old, you have kids, you're going to have grandkids in five years, and you're, well, what are you doing, right? Your vision, I think if you have a clear picture of your vision, it very clearly starts to bring people in and out of your life. I think, you know, um, your vision with your, your spouse, many times we could turn away a cold shoulder, right? In an argument, just go to bed and, and don't give her a hug before bed, right? What's the vision? That's, your, that's the closest person in your life. I've been challenging you. Many times, you know, we were jet lagged last week. My wife came back, she was sick, and I'm running around like crazy. And, and it, she would irritate me, right? And I'm, I'm like, Steve, what are you so self-absorbed this morning? We're both, both jet lagged, right? That's my wife. 
go back over. I'm like, honey, you know what? I'm, I'm tired. And I'm tired too, right? Relationships is the most fulfilling thing, I think, in life. Family, friends. You know, interestingly, uh, Facebook, friends and Facebook, right? An interesting thought to consider with relationships is the word friendship, right? Is the old English word free on, to love, right? So if you're my friend, do I love you, right? And you start to walk around, have a few, I, I can, I, you can only have a few friends, a few people who you can love. Does that make sense? But to have a few friends who love you and love me, each other, is one of the most powerful things you can ever have in life. It's a desire, I think, that when people have good friendships, a lot of the other junk goes away. So I think a vision in life is to have good friends. And I think you build a friendship. You don't have a friend, you build a It takes time. And if, you, if you're cognitive of the idea of building relationships and friendships, uh, that has really, really, really blessed me. Um, just finishing off, uh, sustaining your vision is uh, a big deal for me. A lot of times uh, ADD realtors get distracted really easy, right? And uh, the concept for me is how I've dealt with that. This is a thought is if you write something down, they say in Harvard, there'll be 24% higher chance of it being accomplished, right? If you have accountability, you'll have a 76% higher chance. So if your friends and family know where you're going to go and have accountability, there's a much higher chance it's going to be sustained. What I do is I have a little den office here and I maybe two to four times a week, I have a whiteboard and I have, this is what I want to do in the year, this is what I want to go, all that kind of stuff. And I look at that pretty well every day. Two minutes, something's half an hour, right? It's kind of a quiet time, meditative time, thoughtful time. And I, I gather my thoughts, right? It's like this morning, you know, when John said, come speak at this, I'm like, well, I'm really busy. And I thought, when I thought about it, I thought, you know, I want to help. I, I want to inspire. If I got one person to get their vision up, I'll feel really good. Right? If one person can't see past tomorrow, right? And I thought, you know what? That, that's part of my vision. I want to do that. So I said, I'll, I'll do it, right? So I had to get up early this morning and take notes and try and be intelligent and put a tie on. And <laughs> Honey, could you dress me this morning, you know? <coughs> but the idea is, if that whiteboard kept me plumb lined with where I want to go. A couple of things here uh, that I kind of stand by that I'll leave with you just to finish off here. I feel like a preacher. I'm just about to finish like that. Um, <laughs> An old proverb says, the plans of the diligent lead to plenty. The plans of the diligent lead to plenty. Right? So some people think that's for type A people, but you may want to have plenty of time, plenty of downtime, plenty of time with your kid, whatever. But the plans have a plan. The word diligent is really vision-based. It's focus. A diligent person, somebody, the word diligent means consistent, persistent, focus. There's a sharpness to it. The plans of the diligent lead to plenty. Some people, I want plenty in business. I want plenty with relationships. I want plenty like that over here. But the idea is I would leave that alone and focus on the simple plan and being consistent with that. One thing I've noticed is that uh, it, I'm 47 years old. I feel as if I'm getting really old. Is the concept of tolerance, you know. When you have a clear vision, right, it's like the dog. I heard this story, story of a dog lying in a, in a shop, right, and he walked by the dog every day. And the dog's always belly aching. And he goes, what the wrong with this dog? And the guy goes, he's lying on a tack. A little tack, right? A little pin. He goes, why doesn't he get up? Right? And he can't be bothered. He's just tolerating this thing. Right? I think when you get a clear vision, your tolerance level starts to go away. It just goes away. And that's kind of cool. Because your tolerance for just the mediocrity and going back and being a great dad, being, going back and being a great husband, going back and being a great friend, just bringing things up, bringing, putting into life, you know. I have a boxer dog, right, and I take it for a walk, and I love this dog, but I, if I don't pour into it, it's so intelligent, it comes into the room, right, and it sits with his back to me. <laughs> <laughs> it, it puts his middle claw up, you know. <laughs> right, I'm serious, right. But that's the box, super intelligent, but when I pour into that dog, take it for a run every day, we hang out, it is like a buddy. And I think that's with life, with vision, when you pour into it. So a couple of quick quotes and we're done. Sight is limited. What I can see with your senses, sight is limited. But vision is limitless. Vision inspires, but sight depresses. Look at my checkbook. I'm depressed. Look at my vision. Hope, inspiration, creativity starts to pop. Sometimes in transition... If somebody's in transition here today, I think it's, it's so important that you write down where you're going to go to, have focus on it, write it down and focus on it, because the now is probably not that good transition here. The only, it was uh, Helen Keller, I think it was, says, the only thing worse than being blind 
It's having sight but no vision. So that's really all I had to say, guys. I just want to encourage you that it's a really simple topic, but it's so heart, basic, fundamental to life. Part of my vision comes from my faith, right? I pray, God, give me vision, give me ideas, give me the grace to stay with the vision, right? Give me the tolerance, you know? But the idea of having that plumb line has inspired me. I came from Scotland 20 years ago, and uh, if it wasn't for vision, I, I, I couldn't stand up, and I would have rolled over many, many times. So anyway, thanks for letting me share, and uh, it's been real fun. Thank you.